Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Kraus. Our guest today is Karel Ulner. Uh, Karel is a music producer and a corporate headhunter. Karel, welcome to the pod. Thank you, Spencer. It's a pleasure to be here. Pleasure to have you. Yeah, so I, I met you the other day through work, and um, we started talking, and I remember asking how the hell you got into Olin, uh, which is a really, really difficult school to get into for anyone listening that I wanted to get into but couldn't myself. And you mentioned having some billboard uh, charting singles, which I don't think I know anyone else who does. So that got me really interested, and here we are. So I appreciate you accepting my invitation, and I'm kind of excited to hear how you went down that road and how you got into that. Absolutely. Thank you, Spencer. So that is a very long story technically, but um, starting with the whole Olin thing, I definitely uh, don't see myself have going down that path if I had not been in the music industry, had um, those couple billboard hits under my belt at that point. Um, I think I've always been very kind of music centric. I didn't see myself, uh, even when I was very young, I didn't actually see myself as like being a very serious about going to college. But um, by going into music school and doing business studies on the side, and really just the whole journey of like artist development, basically making something from scratch in your basement, trying to build it, build it to that billboard level is what um, ultimately kind of led me down that path kind of a probably also help them take me a little bit more seriously as well but um I, awesome. it was a pleasure to be at, uh, at olin i was there for about a semester i got uh, a whole certificate done in that time nice um i didn't i didn't pursue the whole masters but that was what i was uh, really there for a very marketing focused entrepreneurial business stuff that's awesome yeah um so i mean i just i'm so curious about the music thing just because it, it's just mind-boggling um I, I had a buddy whose dad um, was a recording uh, engineer. He did some work with Biggie Smalls and Smashing Pumpkins when I was a kid. And he kind of wow. got me interested in, uh, in engineering. So we would build these gadgets in his attic. Uh, so one thing we did was we made, uh, it was stupid. It was like an alarm system that would drop a ball on your head when you broke a laser yeah. beam on a door. And he was trying <laughs> to build a CD robot at the time. This would have been the late 90s. So I think it was like 97, 98. And I remember um, he had this thing where he took the centers out of uh, CD trays and he had a solenoid that would push down and grab it off a CD burner or a stack, put it into a printer, and then put it in a finished pile. And he paid this guy Juan to do it. And he's like, Juan already does a half-ass job. Why should I keep paying him to do a quarter-ass job? You know, and so he was, it was kind of not really politically correct from the robotics perspective, but... I mean, it, it was neat that he was trying to automate this job, you know, and that it really influenced me. And I just thought, you know, that's that's so cool. You can make that in your attic. And so sort of similarly, I, I really looked up to it. So I don't know. I think I have like a soft spot for the music industry and whenever I meet anyone. Was there like a moment when you like dropped, you know, one of your creations to like a famous DJ or something where like you really started to kind of get into these collabs? Because you mentioned knowing like Armin Van Buren and Tiesto, which are big names like even to me growing up in that time and you know even now I mean how'd you how'd you kind of get your foot in the door with those guys sure so starting from sort of the very beginning I had done everything that I could learning really instruments um, I always had a passion for for music just kind of starting playing piano um, playing guitar cool. I immediately kind of gravitated towards wanting to compose music um, which led to them trying to figure out, well, how do I record myself? Then at that time, around, I was around 2004 or five, there was GarageBand that was available on, you know, on the Mac computers. And that I learned how to do some stuff with that. So I started becoming like a one man band through doing that. Nice. And then, then it became like, well, how do I like, you know, I started finding more friends that were like doing the same stuff, I started forming bands. That's when I really kind of found my group of friends. Um, That's awesome. And really going high school, from middle there. school, just to kind of place it. Yeah, exactly. Like middle school time was like cool. when I really kind of found like a like my crowd, and I, you know, uh, felt more comfortable with myself and what I wanted to do. I always had that. I can't really describe it, but I always had that drive. I knew I wanted to do something with music always. Cool. Um, and and combined with just kind of building building something with a fun group of people. That's awesome. And uh, so 
really getting to that stage. Um, I didn't get there until I was in my first year of college. Um, I was part of this organization called Grammy University. Um, I just happened to, um, they, they put out these um, uh, kind of event invites, or at least at the time they did. And uh, I was like, constantly searching for well, what's the next event I can go to. I just wanted to meet as many people as I could. And one of the opportunities that came up was uh, seeing Armin Van Buren on Halloween weekend. This was 2015, I believe, 2015 at Pier 94 in New York City. Cool. And I had coincidentally already tickets to see Skrillex the next night on Halloween <laughs> night. So <laughs> I was like, okay, I'm, I'm going there no matter what. And I just happened to like, happened to be one of those first few people who got in through the door to get the spot and Armin basically was giving this whole um, presentation about the new technology that he was using in his shows um, to this kind of a tight-knit group of people that were invited through the organization nice. we're basically backstage at that venue that's awesome and he's just having yeah he's just like casually talking and <laughs> there's some uh <laughs> he was it's very funny how he was talking about like i really want to make all kinds of music but everyone just wants to hear me do trance music and, <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, he has this proprietary technology that where he's able to communicate to the visuals and lights people like what he's about to play next oh neat. um so um that's what he was doing at least at that time and um and he was kind of showcasing how that worked. Um, and then we kind of hung out until the show started and then we get to go to the crowd and see how it, everything worked, you know, in action. Um, and, but uh, going from there, coincidentally, the touring manager of Armin uh, named Emily Tan was someone who en ended up uh, kind of showing up later on, you know, in multiple different areas. Um, she ended up becoming the touring manager for Andrew Rael who nice. I'm still working with regularly. And um, uh, basically, uh, she then helped, you know, make all these other connections or other people involved who I also met along the way who are like friends with her. It's just a lot of like, you meet this person and then you meet another person doing this other project and then they come together and that connection helps build into something even better for the next project. Um, that's just kind of how, at least I got into meeting Armin and you know Andrew Rael, and so the whole web kind of works in this way that Andrew Rael is also coincidentally signed to Armin's Armada label cool so that's uh kind of you know you first meet Armin at this Grammy you you uh, event and then later on you're actually signing songs to his label and get to go to these other cool events it's probably and, a great uh, hopefully way to recruit we can... oh sorry I didn't mean to cut you off there no sorry it's just it's a great way to recruit artists um, onto the label I would imagine to do the Grammy U events yeah, I mean, at that time, probably uh, he wouldn't have taken anything I was making too seriously. But, uh, you know, years down the line, we ended up getting songs signed to the label anyway. So that's really cool. Just, uh, yeah. I, and so cool. this is I mean, I'm sure you can't talk about it, but I'm, I'm so curious about the technology for communicating to the sound and lighting people what, what the next song is going to be and how that worked. But if it's proprietary, I'm guessing you can't say anything. <laughs> no, I, I tried asking about it, and he's kind of like, "There's, I can't really say anything." And he probably, I, I don't know how much he knew about uh, how it worked, but uh, he, he definitely uh, was helping, uh, you know, make the user interface work the way that he needed. So um, mm. that's as far as I understood about it. Oh, good. I'm such a nerd. I, I did a DMX five twelve lighting system for SpaceX's data center back when I was an intern there in 2013. So that, that was really fun. I found pictures of it online later. Um, so, I mean, lighting is, is really interesting to me. And, and there's some other projects I've looked at that for. And then um, just from like a messaging perspective, I remember like similar time frame, late 90s, when I was building those alarms, my one friend's attic and some of the robots early on and stuff like that. Um, we, we came up with a uh, messaging program for the graphing calculators. Uh, we were in sixth grade. And so we wanted to be able to send each other text messages before text messages were a thing. <laughs> and so... We used the link cable. It was very conspicuous, but nobody, it just didn't occur to anyone that we'd be passing notes that way. And you could, right. you could send messages back and forth. So I don't know. I, that stuff just fascinates me. And it's always interesting to see how different people are doing it. So, um, yeah, I, I'd kind of asked um, if there's any other like interests you had or any other types of music besides trance that you're into. And I, by the way, I appreciate that you showed me your work because I hadn't really listened to EDM since like, 
maybe the early 2010s, I was going to a lot of, this is embarrassing, but like happy hardcore raves at the time. And so yeah. like the stuff you make, I feel like is like a lot more adult and like kind of just nice to listen to uh, for like the person I am now. And so I really enjoyed that. Like that's, uh, it's been kind of bringing out like a side of me that I haven't seen in a while, which is like just good for me. Oh, that's awesome. Actually, like speaking of a uh, more like hard style stuff, I, I really, one of my favorite uh, sets that I heard recently was uh, these uh, this duo named De Tweekas, and they had a closing <laughs> set at uh, Tomorrowland Winter this year. Oh, cool. And um, that was one of, uh, I, I have this huge passion for like these very high energy shows where the energy just keeps ramping up throughout the show. Yeah, <laughs> it's kind of like a roller coaster ride, and they were. I feel like they did it the best out of anybody over over the last like you know year or so. That's awesome. They like they took that style to a, a new level, but also they don't take themselves too seriously. I don't think that so genre it's, can it's take fun. itself seriously. But it's, <laughs> it's, I like you said, it makes it fun fun as all. I mean, I yeah, I mean like remixing pop songs. You know, at least when I was going, that was a big part of it, and I'm sure not all of it was licensed and. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> dance as hard as you could. It was it was a really good time. Kind of kind of yeah, wish I had was... as good of a source of cardio at this point in my life. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean I absolutely love that stuff. It's a, uh, um, I used to be in a metal band. Like, nice. Well, a bunch of metal bands really, but like that was a uh, part of my journey towards getting towards electronic music stuff. Um, because I played all these instruments. Like I would go to. I had a friend who uh, had, you know, pretty much like you know real drum sets that I'd bring on my guitar and guitar amp there. Other friends would bring their stuff. Um, we would be able to jam and kind of play each other's instruments. Um, we were trying our very best at like, like age thirteen to play gigs in New York City, <laughs> which is, <laughs> and we we managed to do a few. I mean, seriously, it's uh, we just yeah we, we managed to uh, through some teachers that I had like guitar teachers. They they hooked us up with some some spots as long as we were like early on in the night, like that's you know, awesome before they start serving drinks and stuff. They were we were able to do some proper gigs we ended up being more like a um like 80s and 90s kind of a hard rock cover band when we played those gigs everything yeah. from like metallica to like alice in chains or something so that's it awesome. was a it was just a way to get out there it was well yeah fun, exactly like, like a... i remember one of my uh one of my first robots i built i have this cousin who was in the robotics institute and he was one of the he was like one of the first guys to get a phd in the 70s and I brought this thing into his office, and he goes, "Well, you got to start somewhere." <laughs> and I was like, "Yeah, <laughs> a really backhanded compliment." But yeah, that's that's cool. Yeah, no. And it was it was just a great outlook, because like at that time, especially in high school, like this was around 2010, there was a real kind of peak in that metal metal music world, and um, it was just uh, something that everyone kind of gravitated towards, even though we were just playing small shows or playing the school talent show and you know scaring the kids or whatever <laughs> it was <laughs> it like you had this core group of community who were very passionate and like all these kind of unlikely characters came to hung out hang out basically that's really cool and that bringing people together to have all that fun and like also getting that energy out through playing the instruments and you know that was uh like it's i wish that i could still do more of that it's uh the, but everything has changed so much since then you can't even compare the industry today to what it was like then. What are the differences in your opinion? I think it's become really hard to keep a band together. Um, I think that uh, it's not near like it's not nearly as economical if you're looking at it from the industry point of view. Um, you you are already um, as a solo artist or as a, a DJ producer there's already so many um, things that you have to take care of so many things that are being split already that if you were to split you know let's say you're making a, a couple hundred bucks a night doing a dj gig that that might be fine if you're one person yeah but if you're a band of five people uh, you're not really you're not really going to be able to pay for gas on the way home you know what brutal. i mean it's it's brutal and it's not fair but it's um yeah especially uh one of the other main things is that um the dance music world, um, I'd love to dive into this more if you want, but it's yeah, very kind of decentralized. There's not, um, the industry is, uh, 
still centered around brands. Like you have the Tiestos and Armin Van yeah. Buren. When I would but, listen um, to Digitally Imported, like in the early 2000s as a kid, and I remember it was all people from Europe, like, you know, broadcasting and, you know, like, I don't know if it goes hand in hand with what you're saying, but it, it ticks with, with kind of my experiences. Yeah, I mean, the, um, the way that I experienced it over the last 10 years is that um, it was a way for everyone to express themselves however they want because you can build everything on the computer essentially and then add another layer to that by you know you could be a guy in australia and i'll be in new york and we'll bring our heads together over a project that would never have happened if you were just dealing on a local level and um and again beyond that just the fan base that could be built through this global network the whole billboard stuff would have never happened if i hadn't kind of unlocked that level of collaboration um like just dealing on a local level it's an, it's very great like once you have that audience built but um it's harder than ever to build the fan bases without that global approach that makes a lot of sense um, the collaboration side is interesting to me so this is before people were like working from home because of the pandemic this is even 10 years ago it's just you could because the tech was already there exactly and you know this was already happening you know, probably start, probably starting over as soon as we had video chats, basically made it uh, possible to uh, collaborate from abroad. And, you know, we always had, uh, you know, platforms like Pro Tools and Logic that we used to produce our stuff. Ableton, the list goes on. Yeah. As soon as uh, that became available, um, I mean, that was initially already a game changer. But, uh, you know, again, another 10 years in around 2010, it's just become a way to share files as easily as possible. You don't need the tapes anymore that you have to ship off somewhere to have someone uh, try to add to it. You can just send it over Google Drive or something. That's awesome. And it's there instantly. Yeah, no, I mean, obviously with the studio, I've got a soft spot for audio equipment and, and gear. And so, I mean, the, new, the technology is just getting better and better and better. I mean, I'm, I'm a big Blackmagic fanboy, and so I really like their equipment. Um, I... Uh, yeah, I mean, Pro Tools is legendary. Uh, when I was a kid, I used to mess around with Fruity Loops. Um, I'm sure nobody yeah. uses that anymore. <laughs> no, actually, that's become very prominent in the dance music world. Oh, yeah? It's, it's one of the... It's a, it's a, it's a very accessible, um, affordable tool. It has a lot of stuff built in. Um, you don't need an Apple laptop like Logic would require, even though Logic is fantastic once you do have that. But it's a, you can have a, you know simpler windows whatever setup you have and uh, everything will just kind of work everything's built in so i think that's uh it's made it more possible for people to work on a professional level actually that's awesome what kind of technology and tools are you using in your work these days so i this sounds very <laughs> it sounds very posh like relatively speaking that's but the, i had a i had a great teacher who um, works at the studio named Soundtrack Studios in Manhattan. Cool. And uh, they had uh, they have a resident, one of the resident uh, mixing engineers, Andy Wallace, uh, mixed everything from Slayer to Rage Against the Machine nice. to Nirvana's yeah. Nevermind. That's cool. Lincoln Park. It just uh, wow. You know, when I was there, like they were mixing Avenged Sevenfold's new album. I don't know if you're familiar with that band, but uh, yeah, I mean, um, was, my childhood was full of Avenged Sevenfolds. <laughs> So. Awesome. <laughs> haven't, haven't listened in a while, but I, I know them from from back in the day. Yeah. So that that was um, yeah. This was probably around 2013 at that time. But I was interning there, and I had a great teacher who kind of showed me Pro Tools, and um, I went straight from Garage Band to Pro Tools, and he was nice enough to come to my house and like, literally, kind of configure things. Be like, this is how you this is how you plug in the mic, and this is how you. Um, kind of not o not only that, but just show you how to get the most professional results out of all the tools that I had, uh, and then kind of pointed me towards the direction of a well. This is this is a bit before um, it was as easy to get all the right kind of plugins um, as it is today, but like kind of showed me towards like if you want to get professional results without paying too much money, here's some companies that you could try to start looking into. Maybe get this or that plugin for that effect, and this is how to use those, use those and so on. Um, and uh you know at that time i would literally like i would take electric drums and like try to play into my computer i would plug in my guitar and uh and play and you know we had a um and that has literally 
how can I even describe it? It's like over the last 10 years, I have very few gear that isn't already in the box. Back then, I had still guitar amps. That was I still had to mic up guitar amps. And again, as you know, when before you say that, up guitar, you, know, you mean putting a microphone on the speaker from the amp? Yes, exactly. Cool. <laughs> and that's the kind of stuff that you showed me, like good technique. And so before I even went to college for music stuff, like I kind of had that background. Um, and, uh, you know, this this guy's background himself, I mean, he mixes like major movies. I couldn't uh, pinpoint all the ones that he worked on, but I know that he was talking about Grand Theft Auto. He worked on the audio oh, for awesome. that, I for the video game. games. And yeah, so that's, uh, that's the kind of stuff that he worked on. And he... Um, the first projects I ever worked on, he kind of like, kind of uh, mentored me how to go through uh, mixing, not just uh, cleaning everything up, but enhancing things, and then showing me that there's other steps like mastering, how to polish it at the end, and oh, that's awesome. stuff that you would never know existed unless you kind of heard someone like that talk about it. I mean, having a good mentor, I think, is you can't really replace that. I, I don't know. I mean, I don't think that sounds posh. I think that's fortuitous. You know, it's like. And he right. must have seen something in you if he took the time and, and you know, the initiative to, to sort of, you know, come to your house and show you how to do all that stuff. I, I just basically um, one of the main keys to this whole thing is that uh, going from basically making music in the basement to like getting to go to, you know, Olin and getting the billboard stuff. It all came from just trying to ask as many questions as possible. And I wasn't... Um, I, I was just kind of, I guess you could say it's naive, but you could naively go into these situations as a young guy also and just kind of be like, hey, can I try this and try that? And it, you can fail, and then you just keep trying over and over again until you get it right. And eventually you, uh, I mean, it's it's a bit different being a you know in your 20s, but when you're like a teenager, you can go to these internships and ask stupid questions. And uh, people will, you know, they'll be like, oh, he actually really, really does care. And you keep diving into these other other topics and get to know people and that's really i think really the key um just asking questions getting to know people showing that you're also doing projects that can be taken seriously or that you're trying to um i think you know you'll always find someone somewhere who will want to help um and that's kind of also where like my own ideas for my own uh, company comes from like i i know that it's hard to find people who have serious professional advice who could come into some someone's life who uh you know doesn't necessarily have any access to the right teachers or mentorship. I think um, um, I, I'm essentially trying to create a platform that makes it easier for that advice to be more yeah, accessible. So we talked about that a little bit before the episode, but uh, if you could run through like the uh, the idea again, I mean, I'd like to kind of explore it more and, and hear more about that. Absolutely. So I started this company a long time ago. I started Pol it was basically called Polar Bull Productions. Essentially, it was a publishing company and label that I would release music through initially. But I realized over time that, uh, you know, just trying to find niches in the music industry that they're, uh, people are doing more and more of their work on their own. They're able to do everything in their box, in the box at home. Um, and they end up then putting out the music. It might be like 80, 90% there, but then it's missing something that could have made it even more cohesive. It could have been missing a couple things maybe on the songwriting side that could have made it a hit or something and then they also have no idea how the marketing works and because uh, someone who's focused on the music is not necessarily marketing minded they haven't heard any perspective from that side and what i hear so many people i talk to when you start talking about the marketing side it's it's like honestly a uh, just that in itself is like a mind-blowing thing people think about their whole project completely differently how do i now start community building with my project rather than just tinkering with Pro Tools at home. And that makes all the difference. I don't have to be the person who makes something a hit, but if I'm able to impact someone to help people think a little bit uh, more positively, um, I would love to be that person. And yeah. so I'm trying to build this platform starting with technical advice. You could say that it's some version of Fiverr uh, where you, uh, you could basically send me a track and I can try to uh, help you out and I'm completely open with advice if there's something you think I think could be uh, adjusted I'll basically tell you how um, you don't have to take the advice I mean you don't it's up to you but um, basically uh, I'm I'm passionate about working on in this kind in this kind of way so 
I'm totally fine with that. It's an outlet for me. It's a, hopefully an outlet for other people. They feel happier with the end result. And um, going farther out from there, hopefully um, I can create a better um, creative community where other people I'm working with can also enter that create a basically a more collaborative community if you have a songwriter who's coming to me for advice um i can also connect them with a producer friend of mine maybe they will click really well and they'll be able to create something even even better or vice versa um it it's not fully launched essentially the first piece will be that more so a technical advice piece you yeah. can find you'll be able to find the links to that on you know polarableproductions.com um, you'll be able different. to see how <laughs> You'll be able to see how it, it evolves over time, but uh, it's going to start there. Hopefully, I can, uh, you know, build it into a proper creative community. That's awesome, and I, I feel like that the marketing knowledge it, it just it transcends music and goes into every area. I mean, it's it's definitely true with what I do in robotics. I mean, and I have friends that have manufacturing companies where, I mean, the marketing side. I've got one buddy I've known for maybe like I think around a decade now, and. You know, he talks about, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Documenting a project as being like having a whole nother project to do on top of the original project. So um, when we met, we were in uh, university together. Uh, we are both at Carnegie Mellon. And I remember he, um, he had a dorm room that was just really heavily modified. So they had uh, 2,500 watts of amplifier in, in a rack, uh, so it was these giant speakers, uh, I think Polk audio speakers and these big QSC amps from the 90s. Um, and then they had um, like an air conditioner, even though that wasn't supposed to be allowed. I mean, you kind of need it in the summer here, but it, you know, silly rules. And then they had a, a rig for carbonating water. They had a stainless steel countertop they installed. They upgraded the faucet in their bathroom to a vacuum break that they found in the garbage from like a trash find. They'd installed a dishwasher and they did all this stuff and then later he filmed it and like edited all the stuff together and, and the video was called Extreme Dorm Living. It was kind of funny. But I mean, not the same obviously as, as marketing something successfully, but I think all those little videos and stuff he made have, have helped him out to become, you know, a better marketer for the stuff he's selling now, you know, with his companies. And so I feel like maybe you had a similar journey like in, in how you learned to do that, I guess. What, what helped you figure out the, um, the importance of like marketing and community building and, and how did you act on that to, to further your brands? Right, so again, I started at that place where I just wanted to get on stage and play guitar. That's yeah. all I wanted when I was really young. So, um, but I, I was forced to start thinking about, um, starting with just image being on stage. Um, I was a young kid. I loved wearing sweatpants. I just wanted to get up with my sweatpants and metal shirts and play some play some music or whatever. And I started thinking about my image all of a sudden. And I'm like, okay, this is uh, if I really want to make an impact on the audience, it starts with that. And then it started to evolve into okay, platforms like Facebook exist, um, MySpace existed that I could like actually put my music up there. And uh, with the bands that I was with, I would essentially publish some demos that we made in our basement and realize that, okay, it's just our friends and maybe a couple other people who will like, like it or even notice it. Um, you have these massive communities of, you know, Facebook groups, everyone's even on there, everyone's posting their stuff thinking that, you know, everyone should care about their music and, but no one's actually telling the story for why people should care it's just um and, and it's a very complicated thing it's not as simple as yeah. here's a practical product you know it's um i mean unless i don't know unless you're making some sort of here's a music for relaxation or music to hype you up i mean even that helps but people weren't yeah. putting that out there there's kind of like take me for what i am and you know nobody clicks on that yeah because um, you know, what i am is unknown to the clicker as it were so you know why would i click that because i have no idea what am i get Right, and, and the musicians aren't thinking about that messaging at all. They put so much effort into their, <laughs> into the craft of what they made with the recording that they completely forget about, like, well, how do I convey this to somebody else in another way? And um, so I realized that that wasn't working. Um, I got better at the branding aspect to at least create more of an experience um, with um, you know, videos that I put up 
I started putting more care into all aspects of that. Um, essentially experimenting. The whole process has been an experimentation, but with everything, I tried to take pieces that worked and replicate that again, add, try something else, uh, you know, in the mix, see if that works better. Um, I still have a, a bunch of videos that, um, you know, I've, I've put up, I think since 2015, really, I still have some stuff up on uh, YouTube for under my own name, Karel Ulner, basically. Yeah. But um, the, uh, it shows how you can um, you can go from a kind of a maybe if, if you're able to check it out if anybody's interested they can see where you can start you you can tell that I don't really know what I'm doing but I mean, you know here's some ideas I'm putting it out there and then by the time we get to more like um, like 2018 we're making more professional videos we're able to um, we're doing th everything with more purpose, and we're able to convey the purpose much better. Um, so, I suppose let me just backtrack a little bit. To them. A, a bit of this is also important on the musical side. I was as really as soon as 2015, I was combining all the styles that I thought that you know people that I liked. I tried to combine everything into one, being like, here's everything that I am. Even on the musical side, I would. Um, create this kind of a you know sound sandwich of everything that I thought was cool and that it might have been cool and you know I thought that it was great but it wasn't connected to any other community that existed and uh -huh. I wasn't conveying to those communities why they should care about this um, maybe some stuff that I made could have been cool for the rock community or the dubstep community but I wasn't even trying to um, like actively target them it wasn't until I made a track named closer to my body yeah which is a track. song thank you it's a you know it was experimental it was so kind of a, how do i make something like something pop and mix like more of the edm kind of hard to dance stuff into that mix uh, that was the first uh, kind of very cohesive dance project um that i made and that went actually through multiple stages i made one version that you could probably still find on youtube um and then there's another version which actually ended up getting more attention, which was actually the remix version of it. And that's the link that I, I sent to you. Um, I've heard. The one that you heard. And the yeah. um, it wasn't until that that I figured out how to target the communities that were relevant. I started getting uh, people commenting essentially um, to, to me directly that, hey, like, let's work on more projects together. Um, this was around the same time I went again to that the Grammy University thing with Armin Van Buren. Um, all these things came together because I was messaging with purpose, um, contacting the relevant people, um, and the work that I was doing was starting to resonate. What as was well. the mission I, you went into that project with? I guess that was like different than what you'd done before. So you say with purpose, but I can I ask like what purpose? Um, you know, who are you trying to sell to explicit or may sell is the wrong word, but who are you trying to reach with that? I guess what, what message were you trying to convey? Right. So I was actively trying to create something that could work in a club setting. Cool. And I wasn't sure exactly what components made it feel that way, but I succeeded to a certain extent with that track. And, um, I started becoming aware of the samples that people were using to create a certain effect. I was um, studying more of a certain uh, songwriting style to try to figure out how to simplify my ideas into, into something more hooky. Um, so when, so you get that more, you know, get your hands in the air kind of a feeling when the you know hook comes in. Um, I, I don't know if people feel that way when they listen to that now, but you know that's uh, that was my intent at the time. And um, I started then writing more in a certain um, vein to try to capture people's attention in that club setting, rather than just making this sound sandwich of all the things that yeah, I I've got to say, like, Fly has been getting stuck in my head a lot, of, like, all the songs I've listened to and the tracks you've been on. Like, that one, I think, has just been, like, you know, I've been wanting to listen to it more and more. So I feel like, you know, it, it's interesting to know that that's deliberate, you know, <laughs> Like yeah. How, how do I get people to really want to want to bump this? Right. And it's something that I was also um, I, I'm obsessed with this uh, writer named Max Martin. I don't know if anyone's familiar with him, but he's one of the writers who has 
written like so many of the top 100 hits since uh, basically the 90s from Backstreet Boys, Britney Spears, NSYNC. Oh, cool. Right to the weekend, you know, did not know whatever that. you hear on the radio today. That's so hard. he's a master of that hook writing. And, you know, I, I really, um, I, I studied, I tried to study everything I could about that. Listen to the similarities of like, why does, to, not only his songs, but then just listening to, well, why is one of his songs better than the other? And then continuing to go down that path. I use that same thinking for my own music. Well, why does this sample work better than the other one? Um, and again, you know, music evolves all the time. You shouldn't take the experimentation out of it. But like that helped me get to that point where uh, that, that is the kind of thinking that's required in the on the industry side. Otherwise, it's very hard to, you know, uh, be uh, you, you need to have constructive, be able to give constructive criticism. Otherwise, yeah. it's not. Um, you're not able to move forward. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, it's good that you're trying to give that back with Polar Bowl Productions. And okay, so I have one buddy who is uh, like a YouTube influencer. He's got like half a million uh, followers on YouTube, which uh, this channel is never going to get that high, let's face it. And so um, whenever you, I you talk can to do him, it, Spencer. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that, Carell. But uh, whenever I talk to him about making a video or about, um, you know, just a piece of content, we're working together on a few projects. He, um, he always says, you know, well, why should people give a shit about this? You know, like, what, what's the message you're trying to convey? And I, I feel like he's a lot like you. Like, he's very analytical and, and just trying to understand, you know, step by step what makes something catch on. And so you can't ignore that. And so I guess I'm, I'm really interested in understanding that process more. I realize that's not a good direct question. but <laughs> No, that makes sense. And that's fantastic, obviously. That's a... Uh, um... I think that this thinking can be applied to so many different platforms. It's, it's really a, a brand building kind of mentality. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that as, um, as long as, uh, you know, the, you don't get down to that granular point of point where you are no longer a person. There's no room for experimentation anymore. That's, that's no longer fun. And I think people can tell when it's uh, kind of formulaic, I suppose. That's probably the best way to put it. Yeah. Um, but, um, yeah, really. Uh, there's a. I, I w it's really hard to put into a set of rules. Yeah. It's much more of a mindset, I would say. Interrupt. Well, I and mean, you need that. I guess if you built a heuristic around it, it would become formulaic and and lose its charm. And so, yeah, it makes sense. I think it all stems from what's the uh, message you're trying to convey, and uh, how. You know, especially from a, whether it's music or communicating on a podcast, how can you do that as effectively as possible and then add on to that with other external factors? That's yeah. as simply as I could possibly put it. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> well, I mean, even what comes to mind is like, why is a Quentin Tarantino movie good, right? And it's, I mean, at a high level, if, if I'm looking in from the outside, not being a movie director or producer or having a whole lot of knowledge of that industry, I would say it's because he does whatever he feels like doing and there's creative expression, but obviously that's not true. I mean, cause you, you just kind of debunked that. And so it's just interesting to think about. Um, I, I still haven't obviously mastered this skill, um, but it's, uh, yeah, I feel like I, I got a lot to learn from you on this sort of thing. Oh, it's all good. It's, I mean, I feel like I'm all the time in that R and D phase. I think that it's, uh, it's hard to, especially when you're making music and you're trying to keep that creative spark there. Like you said about Quentin Tarantino, um, he definitely, like there's gotta be that creative spark, yeah, but there's probably, there is that it. point. There's that point. Once you're past that R and D phase of what idea, what ideas am I pulling together? What am I actually making? Then you start applying these other, other so, you know, is it. this on brand? Is this on mission? Does this convey the story we're trying to get across? You know, and, and right. once you've got a mission and a brand for that particular story in Tarantino's case, I think, you know, then you can sort of put things to the test of does it further that or not? And then if not, you know, maybe leave it out. And if so, I mean, I'm just speculating, obviously I'm not him, but that yeah, I mean, I, to be. that's, that's what I feel like roughly happens in every scenario. And it's, uh, <laughs> and it's, uh, um, and I understand the pressures that come with trying to it, it can feel easy to try to just do the same thing over and over again, just, uh, um, because you think that it would work, but the world also changes and yeah. you can't, uh, 
that there's just so many there's too many factors um you can't keep things the same um i do understand though like i've been on the side also um i'm not going to get too deep into this side but i've been part of a project that was trying to uh basically find funding specifically on the funding side of a broadway play oh, cool. and um i was uh you know it was a pleasure to work with a um a creative mind uh who was um basically cre created the whole thing was actually an actor in his own thing but then also trying to figure out the funding side it's just you need other people involved who focus specifically on that otherwise you know i think i do as good as a good as a job i can having the creative brain and the kind of more structured brain conversations with myself but there's a point where you need an external person to just give you feedback and you continue being that creative person yeah. because otherwise you're going to never be creative again. Well, and for sure. And so, I mean, I've had people try to leverage my creativity and robotics and just be like, creative, go. I'm like, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> like, I need, right. I need, I need, you know, a bunch of people I can talk to. I need data. I need, you know, to, to uh, test ideas. I've got to have research and development initiatives. Otherwise, I'm just kind of speculating, right? And you can only get so far that way. So I don't know if that translates directly, but it kind of felt it does. Similar. And uh, and that's also a massive difference. Um, I think something that's very important for people to know is that um, on these high level teams, you have to have specialized people in the end. Um, it's not wrong. I, I think, um, you know, it's not emphasized enough. Um, ultimately, how much team building is necessary. Let's say if you're a Berkeley College of Music or wherever, um, I'm not meaning to point them out specifically, but you know, okay. colleges in general, I've been to a bunch of different programs and talking to people who have been to various programs and there's not enough um, emphasis on the, that business side, let's say that I learned at Olin um, or had hints of learning before going there. It's uh, the, um, you, you need to, uh, you need to be a special, you need specialized songwriters, you need specialized producers who know exactly uh, which sound to use, just like when you're building a robot, I'm sure you need the specialization to oh, make it happen sure. quickly. Um, and, and every high level team in the music industry does the same. You have specialized marketing people for a certain markets, not just even generalized, just, you know, special, specialized, you know, these are the dance music remix people. These are the oh, pop cool. radio people. And, um, you know, you have um, people trying to figure out, well, how do we keep this afloat financially? You know, without it's just uh, completely unrealistic to think that you can run a ship like Tiesto or Armin Van Buren without that team. Yeah, um, that makes a lot of sense. Well, it's, it's, it's honestly, it's good to hear that because I mean, you know, it's, you always wonder, right? Like, even though, you know, you're like, I, I've known what's worked in my own career. I've known what hasn't worked in my own career. And what's always worked for me is to hook up with specialists that are smarter than me in certain areas. And, leverage all of their knowledge against mine and, and build something awesome. And it's, it's cool to hear you say that too. I'm like, okay, cool. Uh, it validates the concept. Helpful. <laughs> so, right. Yeah, it makes, makes a lot of sense. How did you, when you did the remix for closer to my body, was that like, did you consult any specialists there to, to kind of get some external perspectives or how do you go about doing that? Yeah. So basically what triggered me, doing a remix in the first place was um, I was speaking to this British PR company and they were basically saying that they were the first ones who introduced the idea to me that, well, if we have another version, we can reach another audience and it doesn't have to just be this one version. Um, that's another key piece to my thinking today that like, and that's only expanded from there working alongside other companies that, um, specialize especially in the pop music remixes everyone from david Guetta to dua lipa yeah um their whole mentality is that if you can make multiple versions of one song your chances of making that a hit are like exponential that's a really um, interesting way of looking at it and it doesn't diminish any of the other versions you're just expanding the the line as it were so that's cool right and that has also i think the one thing has really impacted is the style of songwriting um songwriting has um it is uh, it is always possible, obviously, to make um, multiple versions of one idea, but you definitely have songwriters today shaping things in a particular way that it is easy as possible. Um, it's hard to put a 
you know, uh, words to what that exactly is, but you, as a songwriter, you just kind of know, like, these, this is a certain way to build a hook to um, make that accessible to both this and this audience at the same time. Um, and then you change the production around it as a different effect. Um, you just, that's, that's a hard thing to kind of put into words, but that's one thing that we think about. Yeah. When I, I think I'm sort of picking up on it, I mean, it, it just sounds like um, you're thinking about who's going to really enjoy this and, and for what reasons. And then you might think, well, if, if these guys over here enjoy it, if I change these elements, maybe these guys over here would, would enjoy that version. And so, I mean, it sounds like product differentiation is, is how I'm kind of reading that. Just going back to my business school yeah. roots. <laughs> so, exactly. Yeah, cool. It comes right back to that. And uh, um and again, the, the first song that made it on the Billboard charts was ultimately the, um, in hindsight, I can say that it was completely a result of that. We had an original version that could uh, um, appeal to a more potentially even like rock and indie audience because oh, cool. it wasn't exactly, it had the dancey element, but it also had guitar in it. And, um, I don't want to hear that one now. <laughs> that, was the, that was the We Get High song. So it was yeah. an original version. And then we made a bunch of remix versions, and there's still a few versions online that we kept on Spotify um, with a whole whole range of people. You had the progressive dance people, uh, some of my good friends named, uh, well, they're a duo, duo named 2DB, cool. um, New Jersey-based. And you have uh, Swack, who went on to work with Tiesto on a multiple multiple projects. Um, that, that uh, you know, just getting, uh, he, he was just starting to bud in the industry uh, people knew about him, so anything that had his name on it at that point was going to get traction that makes from sense. DJs and clubs specifically. Um, and um, then we had, I don't want to say old school, because he's still making fantastic remixes today, but he's been around since the Frankie Knuckles days. His name is <laughs> uh, Ralphie, Ralph, Ralph, Ralphie Rosario, oh, cool. and he made a fantastic, more, um, I would say, more Latin vibey um, version. And there's other chill version from high. Andy Sikorsky. We, this is all awesome. we get high. The same I song. Some of those out. And I sent you the SWAC version because that was nice. the one related to Tiesto. But um, that's the uh, that was probably the most popular one initially. And then over time, people discover the other ones. And um, without that product differentiation, without uh, trying to contact the right uh, people who were um, sort of budding in the industry at the same time, it wouldn't have come together in that same way. And then we had the right. We, we got to know the right people who knew um, such a network of club DJs that you can get them all to play it at the same oh, time. Oh, nice. And um, when you know those people, it makes, you know, it's a, uh, you know, you can't, uh, someone who's just doing something in their basement can't compete with that, obviously. Yeah, it makes sense. And then you can go on on and on from there talking about budgets and stuff. But we, I, I did everything, you know, as DIY as I could. And, you know, that's, uh, I'm happy to, I'm proud to say that I was able to kind of go from the basement to that through just the right mentality and just working at it. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I don't know if you ever saw the uh, video of the robot I worked on, Rucktro, but um, that thing fell off a cliff when we were filming that video. Uh, we had to change out the batteries because things would break. Um, <laughs> I, I had to rip yeah. that thing up. You know, it was, it was really a budget basement kind of job. And so it's uh, I'm seeing a lot of parallels kind of between the work, even though they're totally different fields. So it's, it's kind of fun for me. And also, I mean, it, it, obviously you've, you've got quite a reach. Like I was, I was looking at the Spotify channel for the uh, project you're working on. I'm trying to remember the, the other person's name. It was um, Carell and, I'm sorry. And Exo Janney. Exo Janney, Exo Janney. Next... So Janney is actually my sister. Oh, cool. And, uh, and I didn't um, include her in my projects until around 2015. Um, she was always, she was she's a couple years younger than me yeah. and just wasn't as involved with um you know the whole music building thing as i was at that time but i she has a fantastic voice and um, so she did the vocals you know, on those songs yeah she That's did the awesome. vocals on pretty she's been on all the tracks that we still have up and uh um i think uh this this turned out to be a fantastic you know, duo. Where over over time, uh, we've had a chance to do a few shows. She's a fantastic front front person with her dancing, great vocalist. That's awesome. Um, I I basically do the DJing and visuals in the back. I you know provide my vocals too. But uh, you know, obviously that you know, you can't beat that you know soaring female vocal. 
Yeah, for so, sure. <laughs> so that's uh, it's been a fantastic, uh, you know, again uh, coming back to just uh, working started with working with what you got, but you yeah. know we worked. Yeah, but she sounds great. It. I was gonna ask who does your vocals. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's that's awesome. So it's very very DIY. <laughs> Yeah, ah, good result. I mean, uh, yeah. and yeah. I mean, I think you still have like twenty six thousand followers on the Spotify station, which is not shabby at all. You know, I mean, that's pr yeah, pretty even awesome. Yeah, with the older it's, stuff. Yeah, yeah, even with the older stuff, like in the in the beginning, um, like we had to take some things down and put it back up. But the um, the newest stuff you can uh, on the Carl and Exo Janny, um, page, you can see with collaborations with Ten Steps, for example, the Fly Song. Um, that's obviously always been up and without Andrew Royale's labels uh, support um, I don't it wouldn't be obviously what it is today it was featured on a state of trance and uh, um, that's cool you know it, hopefully, hopefully all this uh, you know connecting makes sense it kind of uh, builds no, up I, into that I, I think it's it's a pretty cohesive story and I'm really enjoying hearing it yeah no it's a and it's a journey we're always uh, I would say um, if you have a chance to check out all the links kind of in, in order you'll kind of hear how things evolved and uh everything that we're working on now we're going we're totally back at a r and r and d stage trying to figure out a whole new sound nice. we know that the fly thing works we can always make euphoric trance That's and we will as hell song <laughs> yeah and i'm glad you enjoyed it it's uh no, i've bumped always... in my car like a whole bunch of times since since the first yeah. time you and i talked <laughs> so... <laughs> no thank you it's uh yeah. it's that was super fun to make but um that was actually one of the fastest projects we ever made. Like we had uh, the initial beats sent to us by 10 Steps, who the backstory of that, he was part of 2DB who remixed We Get High. That's how we got to know him. Nice. Um, and um, he sent the initial beat for it. We wrote the song over it and recorded the vocals like as, as they are um, within two days. We just kind of kept at it, kept at oh, it wow. writing. And uh, yeah, literally just got it done. I had a friend of mine, um, Samantha Daniels, who um, contributed to the lyrics a bit, I was stumped on the verses, like what we're going to say, and she provided fantastic lyrics, and then... Uh, That's awesome. You know, I, I took that and shaped it up a bit, added the melodies and things. And um, there's a, there's of course, there's the process of writing it, but then it's also making sure that it fits with the vocalist's voice, so that takes a little bit of time. And then so is that, sure that, is that just iterative? Great. Like you'll sort of do a version and then Jenny will sing it and then you'll be like, okay, well, we got to maybe change this, this, that. And then you'll record again? Exactly. Okay, cool. And and we record lots and lots of takes. So <laughs> a big piece of that is me just going at it at the computer. Um, I, I've learned so many tips and tricks to kind of... Uh, I could probably... With the tools that we have available today, I could probably take anybody and make it sound good if I have enough takes. Um, <laughs> but I, I think that, um, you know, uh, but if the takes that we got for this, I thought were really kind of emotional. And that's uh, yeah, there's a whole other half of the battle. So how many, I guess, I mean, this is maybe you don't have to answer this if you don't want, but how many takes are spliced together for the production track i mean or I, I mean there's a bunch of different versions but you know like the first one you put out for instance so this is what i like kind of learned from um this, not uh not directly but from listening to all the max martin stuff um that um you could splice together everything syllable by syllable if you wanted to oh wow as long as it, as long as it comes together into a strong kind of cohesive sound um and so that's that's why it's half the battle. You need a good vocalist who's able to kind of, um, you get the the perfect take of that one syllable, but then also being able to sing the whole thing rep, replicates the way that you sang it. So we could get another take of another piece of the same word. Um, oh, that's awesome. Put it together. Well, that, I mean, that's and, uh, kind of a cool thing about electronic music that I don't know. I mean, it probably persists in other genres, but like I feel like electronic doesn't shy away from that. You know the heavy production and and so it's kind of neat that you know you're you're encouraged to do that and just perfect the craft or at least the the work piece as it were yeah and that's what i loved about it so there's that accessibility and uh so many people are able to get involved it doesn't get in the way of the final product being great and um ultimately the i think it's gonna this has expanded into other genres as well um of course there's other 
you know, you don't want to mess with a live jazz band, obviously. But yeah, if you want to... <laughs> Right, and that's its whole um, part of that whole thing. Obviously, having that band really tight in one room, you get it in a cup, you know, at most couple takes in today's world and splice the best together. But you know, the um, without that, with electronic music, you can take people's again, someone's vocal from Australia, plug it in with someone's beat from New Jersey. That's awesome. You know, it all it'll still work. Yeah, and I'm sure you still have to have like good equipment. I mean, wherever you're at, like I mean, these microphones are pretty pretty entry level. They're just around it's MPM 1000s, but you know, I mean, if I had more money to blow in the studio, I would get like Shure equipment and start upgrading. I mean, I feel like you can go down such a rabbit hole with that. Um, do you find that matters as much or you can sort of fix that up in post or do you have sort of like brands you like or equipment you look for or like audio engineers that you like working with or all of the above? Sure, so uh, when it comes to the audio engineering, I, I would say that I would I would go to a particular person if they already have a, a sound that I like, and um, it, it wouldn't make sense for me to learn what they already do, but the, at this point at least. But, you know, in the past, I would kind of tinker with all kinds of things, everything from, the, you know, cheap mics that you have just laying around to, I don't know what would be cheap, but like, you know, just a kind of a cheap, uh, sure live mic or something that yeah. you can have on stage. And it doesn't matter if you get like water on it, it's not going to break, <laughs> but like, you know, it's but you're going to, um, but then you had access to like, uh, some really nice telefunk and mics, um, um, at these other studios. So like, I, I, hear, I know that there's obviously a difference. Um, there is of course a time and place to where each of it matters. The, the, I would say the more that you want, something to have a certain feel i would choose certain equipment okay, other than that, that other than that i think that you if you have the know-how to um just i mean just talking about a vocalist if you have a great vocalist you're able to capture them on pretty much any equipment and you can find um affordable enough plugins to kind of enhance something take out some imperfections um so just kind of putting that in perspective i have i record everything in this room these days nice. i'll record vocals and you might have on a hot day have a fan or like an ac unit making noise like in the other room basically yeah, we've got two and <laughs> exactly but we have the technology to yeah. cut out that sound around you can you just pick up the stuff around the mic you know just the know-how of uh you know affordable tools that exist in terms of plugins and um you know just mic placement everything um it, it can really make a simple setup sound fantastic um but with that said again going back to the telefunken mics if you wanted us the silkiest smoothest sound i mean uh not just smooth but you know the warmest natural sound i mean you can't beat that um you can you can hear the difference um but if you are if you have no other choice there's always affordable options to try to get there if you know what you're doing yeah it makes sense and that's what i would encourage that's what i would encourage anybody who's starting today to explore like you don't need the anymore the big mixing desk to make something work you can all it can all be done from your laptop or possibly even ipad now like it's i don't i don't go that far but i um definitely on your laptop if you want to yeah no, that's awesome I, I do remember five years ago people were saying you know we weren't going to need computers anymore you'd use an ipad for everything and i feel like that was kind of a, a bit of a flash in the pan because obviously you can do way more with you know a, a purpose-built desktop or a nice laptop you know and, and the right dac but um, yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's amazing how far the tech has come and, uh, and just how accessible everything is. And I mean, even in like the late '90s, early 2000s, the fact that like I could open up Free Loop Studio and make something that maybe wasn't amazing, but you know, was a thing that I made, you know, and I, I could feel feel good about that. And so, I mean, that was uh, it was really nice. Um, yeah, I think that's a great message. So. Yeah, and that's that's the case more and more. It's a uh, I use Pro Tools still because that's I feel like it's a it's, a, it's just my personal thing because it's like a blank slate. It's 
probably the least inspiring looking platform when you open it up. Everybody uses and it. From right? my point. <laughs> but yeah, but every studio uses it still, and it's. Uh, um, I'm able to, of course, send files to anyone, but it's. Um, it's. Uh, I guess um, this is just my own personal perspective. If you open up Ableton or Logic or something, especially Logic, I feel that's really centered around making loops. It's a. Uh, it's very easy to you know kind of lay a couple things down, um, you know, play a couple notes with the beat, and you can just loop it. Um, but when you're in Pro Tools, you have to think about every step that you're making a lot more because it's not as intuitive. You have to do everything with purpose, um, at least to make it as um, good as something like Logic or Fruity Loops would automatically try to make it sound like. Interesting. I think uh, it's possible once... to. Oh, sorry. No, sorry. It's possible to skip some important steps when you already have something that sounds satisfying, but, you know. Um, Pro Tools, I, I feel like, is more brutally honest with me than these other platforms are. So, but I feel like once you master a platform like that, you could probably create better and more personalized stuff. You know, so yeah, yeah that's exactly. Awesome. And I, I try to customize everything uh, based on the kind of style of project. Like, I, I if I'm starting a working with a new genre or something, I will I will start from the absolute, you know. Um, basement trying to build the whole thing up again like i'm not gonna um i don't you i don't use as many templates as you would think i just know that there are certain tools or plugins though that i would use for certain styles and i pull them in that makes sense yeah the the engineer i had on uh you know before we started recording is, is a big pro tools fan and so that's that's one of the main ones he likes to use um personally don't have a whole lot of time on the platform but i feel like i i've got a bit of a feel for it just from hearing you talk about it and I'm, I'm thinking of certain CAD packages I use in some of my engineering work that it kind of reminds me of the way you the way you talk about it. Yeah. How, how is that when you're working on your engineering projects uh, with the CAD packages? Is it similar to uh, from your perspective? Well, so like I, I really like SolidWorks a lot uh, for that. Um, it's it's not the cheapest. It's maybe like a five thousand dollar license at the base level, and then I mean you can spend up to twelve or more uh, if you start adding in plugins and stuff like that. But I, I feel like it gives you a lot of control over your design. But like you said, you know, similar to I think how you describe Pro Tools, if you get off the rails, so I was designing these sensor enclosures for an unmanned ground vehicle that is a bit of a passion project of mine over the years. And um, I remember I wanted to change the geometry of it because I didn't quite like the way it looked. And this is like such a perfectionist kind of douchebag thing to do. But I just, you know, I went in there and I, I tried to change the way a certain curve looked to like maybe fit another sensor or like a nameplate or like just to change the aesthetic. I, I can't remember exactly what caused me to do it, but you get what's called a feature tree. So it, it defines, you know, you've got a loft here, you've got an extrusion there, you've got it cuts here. But if all of a sudden, you know, you move this part over here and this part's based off where that part is, it breaks the entire thing. And now you're in for like four to six hours just messing around with it, trying to make fix it and get it all to go back together again. And, and that's true with like maybe some of the more advanced stuff. Like it, it took me, you know, probably thousands of hours into the software to learn how to do like that level of CAD. I'm still not as good as a real mechanical engineer at it. Uh, and I'm more of a robotics generalist, but I, 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 that's kind of what it reminded me of when I heard you talk about Pro Tools. Because you can sort of- Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's fantastic. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it changes the way you look at the world. I feel like when you, when you know how to CAD things or when you learn about like different approaches to manufacturing, so like maybe, you know, something like a sheet, a cast sheet or laser cutting or injection molding or man machining or, you know, um, 3D printing, you start to notice like different machine marks on different things you interact with in the day-to-day -day world. So like this keyboard, which is kind of a little bit fancy, um, you know, you notice that there's these little um, silver things around the keys and then you touch it and you're like, okay, this is plastic. From the shine, I can tell it was injection molded. It probably popped out of a mold upward relative to how it's mounted on the keyboard. Um, and then they probably use the same mold for this key, this key, this key, and this key because they're the same size. Um, you know, and you start to sort of piece together how, how different things were made and, and created. Um, you know, this microphone was anodized. They've got a full four-bolt circle holding it in place. Um, 
stainless bolts, aluminum ring. Uh, and so you just, you start to notice like little, little things like that. And so it's, I don't know if you can ever unlearn the stuff. So, I mean, that must happen when you're like listening to a song by somebody else, you start to reverse engineer and try to be like, I think this is what they did. So. Yeah. <laughs> I've, uh, I feel like in the last few years, um, I've tried to, uh, I tried to rediscover a lot of, um, w what was, kind of wondrous about the music in the beginning for me it's uh, i went through a little bit of a a phase like especially like um around 2020 where things slowed down where i was trying to um i, I got to that point where i was i can like analyze everything but then um it comes back to if you lose that inspiration what's behind it you just it's not as fun you need to change things up i, I, I think so. how would i how would i say it it's um I try to turn on different parts of my brain when it's necessary, but try to always approach everything from that point of view of what really made this exciting in the first place. And uh, um, understanding how everything works isn't, you know, isn't the most joyous thing all the time. Yeah, I concur. <laughs> well, and, and I mean, there's so. there's definitely certain aspects of design. I would say even more than engineering that get it. You know, like you said, wondrousness of things. I mean just something that feels good or like, you know, you've got, so that, that audio engineer I mentioned having as a mentor at an early age who sort of taught me about automation and circuitry and, you know, just certain aspects of engineering that I still use in my career to this day. Um, one of the things that he talked about, I, I bought this tube amp and I, I fixed it up and I think I got it for like $6 at a secondhand store. And I searched on eBay and it was going for like 800 bucks. I was really proud of myself. And I replaced all the capacitors and, and just put a bit of work and I've got it. It's like a 1960s era tube amp. I've got it playing through 80s tech speakers. Uh, so they're JBL uh, HP 420 towers. And then it's a Sherwood S5000 too, tube amp. And I, I love that thing. Um, but Francisco said to me, he's like, you know, you're never going to get that glowy sound that you get from a tube amp from any other type of equipment, you know? And so I thought, that was really interesting. But, you know, again, you don't necessarily want to, oh, they used a tube app. They put that through that when they, you know, recorded this particular track. You know, maybe that's a little bit, you know, missing the point of, of what makes it awesome. Uh, so, yeah. yeah. I feel that way when it comes to um, to cars a little bit. Oh, I, nice. So when it comes to, um, uh, I, well, hopefully this, uh, this doesn't, come off the wrong way but the essentially when i was younger i had saved up a lot of money to um buy like a used ford mustang oh, whatever cool. that was at um probably would have been a 2010 model or something nice. and um and i decided that you know i'm gonna just uh, I, I decided to spend the money on music gear instead to make sure that i can um make this uh, endeavor as professional as possible i just felt that you know this is going to come back in the end in a positive way so I, I'll, I'll buy another Mustang another day. So, <laughs> That's um, awesome. So, but when I, um, and I actually, I, I ended up uh, buying a 2016 Ford Mustang like er, earlier this year just nice. to kind of re, re <laughs> kind of uh, recapture that, that, that dream. Um, but the, um, thank you. It's a, but it was a, it was one of those things that like when I look at the, when I look at it and I, I hear it um, and the, joy that comes from there's a particular way that it accelerates and the way that it sounds when it accelerates especially from the the 2000 uh, you know three four thousand rpm that's very satisfying like it i almost don't want to know why it does what it does <laughs> um i just i just focus so much on how it sounds and how it feels when it does it um that's just one of those things that like i I mean, yeah, I'm, I'll, I can always find a YouTube video maybe to find out. No, no, so, no, so the, I, I enjoy it so like, much that, that I don't really think like, about that. <laughs> I, I, I love the V8 sound, but I got the look, I look, got look, the V6. Look, look, look. They're a yeah. lot more practical. But, um, yeah, I, I drive a, a V6 too. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's um, it's just a, uh, and uh, there's that, I don't know, it's just just that uh, it has a kind of. I guess it's a wow factor. I would say it's <laughs> you. You feel like you're a, a bit more. You're a certain character when you get into that car. That's awesome. Versus, uh, you know, that, that's a. Uh, I try to focus on you know how that feels versus uh, just trying to figure out how that works because there's so many things that, you know, I try to figure out on a regular basis that you got to have something where you're just like, okay, this is, 
I'm gonna let it be and just enjoy that. Enjoy it for what it is. Yeah, no, I guess for me, like watching it, like a good film is kind of like that because I have very little optics into how that process works. And so, like I mentioned, Love and Tarantino. I mean, also like a pretty big Guy Ritchie fan, although it's a bit more formulaic. And then, um, you know, really enjoy, uh, I just saw that movie Night Teeth on Netflix because one of my podcast guests had a son that was an extra in it. And so he told me about it and it's like, yeah, I should check that out. And it was like a fun story, you know, it was really awesome. And sometimes it's interesting to, to dissect and sort of look at how it's made. And, and when you kind of like, oh, there's, you know, Steve's son. <laughs> but yeah <laughs> other, other t- or like you know maybe you know they I, I see you know they they voiced this bit over after it was recorded but then i feel like you're kind of missing the point like if if you just enjoy you know the art at at face value with that like it's almost better that i don't know how it's made i, I have a buddy who has done a lot of work with david fincher and he's actually he he lives next door to the studio that i'm in right now and um you know, when he starts talking about the stuff, you know, I'm like, I'm almost glad I don't know what you know, because I feel like I can enjoy the genre more. <laughs> so, Right. I mean, I guess even <laughs> for me, music falls into that camp just because I don't have your knowledge. Um, but, you know, I mean, I know a little bit, like I, I hang out with people that are better at it than me. Um, and then you start to notice things. I think if a friend points something out that can be nice. So, um, like, uh, there's there's one song in particular and I'm struggling to remember the name of it, but it's um, it's like a Motown song that that I really like and I, I've been listening to it for years and one day my buddy Bryston uh, who plays the bass like pointed out like the bass line to me which I'd never paid attention to and it it just got so much better because I could focus on that I'm like oh, wow it is an amazing bass line like that that's just it's beautiful to listen to. But I'm sure if I went even deeper and I started looking at, you know, the engineering, and it might lose some of its charm. So I, I can dig that approach as well. Yeah, I I, I totally agree. I, I, yeah, what I was mentioning about, like, around 2020, I got to that point where I was, I, I can, I, you, know, you know, it's almost like when you're able to replicate that thing that you really love, you almost get to that point where it just loses its charm because now you've you conquered it. You kind of figured <laughs> it out. And it's like, okay, well then what's the next thing after that? It's not exciting as it was because you spent so much time figuring it out. And um, I, I can totally, going back to the whole Armin conversation, like I can imagine that he probably felt that same way about <laughs> trance at that time and probably probably had to like, wanted to work with more people and kind of reinvent themselves. What other kind of music do, do you know that he looked at or can you say? I'm, I'm just be kind of curious. I, well, I, I'm not sure exactly what he did at that time, but I know that it, it really feels like he reinvented himself with new collaborations during, uh, was it around in the couple of years following? He he was under the pressure, surely, of um, having that Grammy award from This Is What It Feels Like, and, you know, he, you get to that level of fame where people come and see you because you're the you know number one DJ in the world rather than knowing your work. Well, that sucks ass, I'm um, sure. I, like, it probably is great, but I would imagine also just someone that doesn't know a thing about you just to see some spectacle, you know, it probably puts you in an awkward position. Yeah. Right, and if, if uh, it, it must be tough to be the, to have the number one platform for trance music and for, you're, you're kind of holding the door open for people to kind of follow you through. Um, if he stops doing it, then what what happens? It kind of closes the door potentially for the other people trying to grow as well. So it's a uh, um, it surely he, I, it must have impacted him somehow. But um, I know that you know he he really kind of dove deeper into uh, a kind of pleasing more of the you know club music audience, more of a, a festival audience following that. Um, at least that's how I felt um, listening to his stuff that came out a couple of years following that makes sense um and i'm a huge fan of what what he does with like the darker heavier stuff i think that, that's really i gotta go back and that, listen to his music because I, I haven't listened to armin i'll be honest in maybe like a decade and so i feel like i, I need to listen to the new stuff and, and get that perspective yeah the, I, I love um i think i added that playlist that i sent you um it's called great spirit it's like a collaboration with Vinnie Vici and it sounds like they have like you know these Native American chants and oh, cool. you know that's sort of a like kind of a site it's called like Psytrance kind of a, a beat to it I do love Psytrance um, like at least I, I did like maybe 15 years ago I don't know how it's evolved since then and I'll be honest I did not get a chance to listen to that track yet but I will and so 
Yeah, no, it's uh, it's totally cool, and I, I love how. Um, I guess it's one of those things where the style came back, but it came back, um, you know, to, you know, fit the modern audience, I suppose. Um, I I I loved that particular style, and I kind of we threw that into like songs like Fly with the intro, and you know, it it's a, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of those darker, heavier styles as as much as I love the pop hooks. When I when I when I, I, I go out, like it's like that's mushroom that's a while. I, I remember when I was you know like an undergrad. So I, I don't know if that captures like Psytrance at all, but I feel like yeah, there, I know it. There were there were like yeah, a I'm few Psytrance a... bands I, I did really really enjoy and, and projects that you know I mean it's just I don't know it's fun. It kind of touches a part of your brain. I think it all does. Like that's a beautiful thing about EDM in particular and, and really all music. Yeah, and, and there's. Um something I'm really fascinated with just on the whole um, finding that special moment with music. There's very, there's ultimately very few moments um, that you, you truly remember these. There's some, for me, at least there's some pivotal points. Like when I heard uh, Skrillex, Skrillex for the first time, um, it's probably a combination of the, where I was at in my life at that time, there was probably a lot of change, but also that, encompassed so many of the things i loved it was so creative in terms of the sounds it was heavy like metal music was and you know it's a uh, um and music obviously has not been the same since that was introduced i mean that it changed the whole sound scape of how everything's produced since then but it's um, That's awesome how would i say it it's uh some things just have that impact for other people, I know that for my for my parents, let's say it could have been Bon Jovi. They heard Bon Jovi at that perfect time, and it sticks to, sticks with you with forever. You know, I'm, I'm giggling because Bon Jovi just moved into the same neighborhood as one of my relatives. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> really? That's uh, that's really cool. Yeah, I was uh, got a got a uncle who's like a Fortune 500 CEO, and I mean, obviously earned a lot of money doing that, and so. There's a neighborhood uh, that he recently bought a house in. I think Oprah and Bon Jovi both moved <laughs> into the neighborhood. So me and his son will kind of joke around and speculate as to what it's like having Bon Jovi as a neighbor. And so that's yeah. led to some funny conversations and impressions of Bon Jovi. That's, <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Thanks. No, yeah, I mean, I never met him. I hope he's a cool guy. I, it yeah, seems I feel like, like he would a, be. Like, I would imagine yeah. he's just pretty down to earth and doesn't take himself too seriously. It was kind of our speculation. But I haven't met him either, so I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I've i only seen him in concert a couple times. I saw him in, um, what was the last year of, uh, uh, there was this bamboozle festival that was held at, um, was it the, it's, it's escaping me now, but it was in the, uh, um, one of the beaches in Jersey, essentially, one of the classic spots near where Stone Pony is. Oh, cool. I'm not sure. It's, it's just escaping me right now. But he was, it was actually Skrillex was, the first time I saw him was there. He opened that first Friday. Nice. Foo Fighters was on Saturday oh, awesome. and Bon Jovi was on Saturday, on Sunday. Sweet. And <laughs> that, <sounds> like <laughs> that was like one of the most impactful things for me at that like time. An eclectic but like awesome lineup at the same time. That's That's great. Yeah. And it was a great show, like fantastic band. Somebody sent me something recently where it was, I think it was in Napa Valley, unfortunately. I really wanted to go. I thought it was in New York because it was through the Blue Note. But it was um, it was Snoop Dogg and Dave Chappelle and, and like a couple of other just awesome artists and comedians. And I, I was kind of bummed when I found out it was on the other side of the country because I was, I was getting really amped up about it. <laughs> Uh, some of the, Dave some... Chappelle is one of my favorites as well. Oh yeah, that, but... I didn't realize that. Yeah, I all the way back from the Chappelle show days. I, I remember love Chappelle that. show. <laughs> I actually just showed uh, the Rick James sketch to one of my friends the other night who hadn't seen it before, and she she loved yeah. it. I mean, it's classic. I mean, it's a re... like, but the fact that they actually got the real Rick James to come on, <laughs> it's like substantiate yeah. Charlie Murphy's ridiculous stories, <laughs> and then Chappelle's Rick James impression was so hilarious. Have you seen yeah. Have you seen the show The Boondocks? Like just to kind of go off on the tangent. For, so I didn't yeah, realize absolutely. up until yesterday that uh, Charlie Murphy does the voice for Ed Wensler the Third. I don't know if you really. Yeah, and then um, the voice of Gin Rummy, like his buddy from Iraq, is uh, Samuel Jackson. So just the nice. fact that like the whitest character in the show are voiced <laughs> by Charlie Murphy and Sam Jackson was was hilarious to me. And so that's um, hilarious. Yeah, it's it's definitely it's it's amazing. 
Chappelle, I, I got to see him live um, during the pandemic, actually, in 2020. I went to one of the Yellow Spring shows. I, I had earned some money on, on a fast-paced project that year, and um, so I just thought, you know, treat me and a buddy, um, and it was it was really, really cool. I mean, it was intimate. I think there were probably only like 150 people at the show. He didn't do as much stand-up as I would have liked. He was emceeing between, uh, Denel Rollins did a bit, Christine Wolf, uh, who, I mean, I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm just not the hugest fan of hers. But, um, you know, obviously Rollins was actually Larry. That's pretty cool. Mo Ammer, who I really like, uh, you know, was, was there. And then, uh, I'm going to mispronounce his name, but uh, Twalib Khalib. <laughs> Like the rapper, uh, who again, I, I'm sure I butchered his name, but I, I was listening to him on the way out, so that was just such a pleasant surprise that he was also there, and uh, it's just like definitely just a great memory. Who else? Who else do you like for stand-up? Can I ask? Uh, let me think. I mean, I was just watching Bill Burr's uh, oh, last night. Dude, yeah, I just did. You Bill see, Burr. Was it the new one? Yeah, the one from Red Rocks. Yeah, yeah, same. I've been wanting to go to that venue really bad for a while. Yeah, it was so cool. I'm, I'm That's about. Classic again two-thirds of the way through it <laughs> so. yeah i got halfway through it i'm gonna watch the rest of it tonight but it's uh nice. I, I, think I, I love well. like yeah <laughs> it, it, it's because of um I, I grew up on shows like south park obviously yeah sam i'm i don't shy away from the crude stuff it yeah. is brutally honest stuff yeah i think that's like the the best i mean it's a uh, Chappelle does it so um i you he does it with so much um finesse yeah, that it's impossible to kind of imagine anybody anybody else doing that. Bill Burr is, uh, you know, the <laughs> just goes right for it. Yeah. <laughs> and you have um, what's his name? The Machine. What's his uh, name? Burt Kreischer. Burt Kreischer. <laughs> yes. So I, I loved his stuff. Um, obviously, since seeing that that skit, audience, honestly, that's a, that was a good one. Yeah, I watched but, that with um, some Russian friends, and they were saying that like his Russians, like apparently he gets the conjugations wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, which, which is right in it, line with the story. No, it's a it, it's great. I mean, like I'm I'm originally from from Finland, so like I I do get that. But it's also like I've lived here in the U.S. long enough that I you know I find that stuff hilarious. It's like yeah. <laughs> I don't care how they did it. It's just the story itself is so well. And the story is about him so sucking outrageous. a Russian, right? It, it's the fact that he knows <laughs> no Russian. So he refers to himself as the machine because he doesn't know any of the other words. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> like I showed it to like I when I, I used to live in Milwaukee when I was working at Joy Global and I showed it to like I just for some reason I ended up being friends with all the Russians there. And I showed it to like a few of them, uh, these guys, Dimitri and Dimitri I knew, and they just showed it to like all the Russians in Milwaukee. <laughs> like those those guys thought it was hilarious. So yeah. That's amazing. That's... Yeah, for sure. <laughs> And then no South Park I love that's that's still one of my have you seen the stuff on Paramount Plus yet? The uh, the newest stuff the specials yeah the, or... the streaming wars and the post COVID. Yeah, so I saw the uh, the post COVID one so far. I have yet to catch up on all the newest stuff, but I feel like I've... they're back. Like I th I think they lost it for a few seasons, and I feel like they're coming they're coming back with with that stuff on Paramount Plus. Oh yeah, I, I think they got, wasn't didn't they get like eight hundred million dollars to like make new movies and come out with new seasons or something? I didn't even realize they earned that much money on it. That's insane. That's like, that's what they that's got like twenty to, like, times what stuff. Dave Chappelle got for like one of the stuff. <laughs> it's incredible. I mean, I mean, South Park. It wasn't isn't it pretty much one of the most successful kind of comedy shows of all time? I mean, at, at this point, or it's got to be right. I, I mean, could the be number wrong, of seasons but... they've ran. Yeah, probably. I would. Just, I mean, it's universally appealing. I've had friends from all walks of life who've enjoyed it. I mean, you know, it, it like you say, it just pokes fun at the disingenuous, and you know, it, it's it's honest. You know, which I mean, you gotta love. Yeah, I, I would. As a kid, I was a big fan of George Carlin. Like, I feel like that was a voice of reason to me when you know, like, I feel like a lot of adults kind of were like, maybe not lying, but you know, feeling like they had to censor things or, or sugarcoat or you know, just put a certain spin. And I saved up like this, hopefully this doesn't sound bad, but I saved up my allowance uh, for several weeks and I got to see George Carlin when I was 14 years old. Uh, he came to a small town in upstate New York I lived in at the time. And I saw all these kids from my school there. There was like a person I had a crush on. And when I saw them, like I, the crush became like 10 times more, you know, as we connected over George Carlin. 
I feel like Chappelle is like like him, like a lot, like in Richard Pryor as well, and then maybe Lenny Bruce before them. I feel like that's like that's there's there's very few people I put in that group, and I think it's just those four. But um, yeah, it's it's just it's philosophical, I guess. Oh yeah, it's um, I I'm trying to I'm so bad with names if I don't regularly deal with deal with some, but it's um. There's a, I love how it's all kind of compiled now on platforms like Netflix. Yeah. There's sure. a bunch that I discovered that I would have never known about. And uh, it kind of reminds me again of the same thing with uh, iTunes, how they came up with recommended um, lists and how Spotify is now. It's, it's really nice how, you know, everything could be now discovered much more easily. I completely agree. There's a bunch of artists I found through Spotify that I never would have known about if I hadn't been for that. And so, like, I, I'm seeing this bluegrass band, um, like, in a couple of weeks called the Tayon Street Corner Thieves. I can't remember who I was listening to, but, I mean, I, uh, I, I've, I've just been like, cranking these guys in the car, you know, like a whole, I could probably sing along to every single one of their songs at this point. And um, they, they're playing with the Dead South, which I guess they have that song in Hell I'll Be In Good Company that kind of, like, hit, but... I don't know. I mean, I like them, but I love the Tam Street. Like they're they're just all their songs are about like drinking to the point of hurting yourself. And so they're like they're not happy songs, <laughs> but it's it's soulful and it's it's like decent music, which I, I really enjoy. And then there's this guy Wheeler Walker Jr. I don't know if you've heard of him, but I found out about my. I'm not familiar. I was listening to like a Johnny Cash radio station. He sings these ridiculous songs with. I won't repeat it here, but they're like these they're comedic themes and like. Like he just, it's like he calls it like an X-rated album, and so like, he it's it's pretty funny. It's like he he gets like a decent country band uh, from Nashville to like back him up, and then he just sings these ridiculous over-the-top songs like with just you know, completely ridiculous like uh, you know just almost pornographic themes, and it, it's pretty hilarious. And so and, and like actually good music too. Like the fact that Spotify recommended that when I was listening to Johnny Cash, I thought was was hilarious and now yeah. I've, like I've listened to all of his albums <laughs> so. yeah. yeah and i'm honestly uh i'm the biggest fan of um of course there's classic johnny cash songs but it's the um what was the one um the cover of nine inch nails the hurt, hurt. song yeah i thought that was interesting that cash covered nine inch nails and i'm obviously like a big trent reznor fan as well not obvious i'm a big trent reznor fan as well like i grew up listening to nine inch nails and, and like to some extent Marilyn Madsen and they had some collabs they did although I haven't listened as much lately but I, I thought that was interesting to see those two genres come together in that song yeah and, and I heard that there's some crazy story about I guess it was a bit before Johnny Cash died and his wife had died I suppose um, I guess he just poured his heart out into those recordings and uh, I guess it was probably the last I think it was the last album that he ever did but um that's just crazy to think about how, you know, I don't know if uh, he would have been able to create that performance if it wasn't for all the things that happened at that time. Makes a lot of sense. I mean, I, I, I really like the prison performances he did, like uh, Live from San Quentin and uh, Live from Folsom Prison. I thought were interesting, like for a similar reason. I mean, it's like a dark side of humanity. I mean, and to, to channel that into something beautiful, I feel like is, is just incredible. Oh yeah, and it's um, you know, again, those uh, comes back to that creativity side, the capturing those moments. It's uh, I mean, that is truly priceless. Being able to create that window into that point in time, and doing that so masterfully. Um, Do you know what uh, album that is? I, where he, uh, the one after his wife died, where he he kind of. I believe that it was, um, I, don't, I forget the name of it, but I, uh, what I understood was it was, uh, the, the Hurt recording was on an album of a bunch of covers that he did. I think it was a cover album, from what, at least from my, There's my some recollection. Good cover I could be wrong. The, have you yeah. listened to, uh, are you into Mike Ness at all, uh, from Social Distortion? Actually, no, I'm not as familiar as I should be with that. Uh, it's all good. I mean, but, like, punk artist, uh, but he, he has a really good cover album called, like, Cheating at Solitaire. I think I don't know if it's all covers, but I, I feel like a lot of standards, and I think he's got a bunch of other artists on there, like huge names. Um, and so I don't know. I feel like he's really talented. He's just got an amazing raspy, you know, 
smoked like a thousand cigarettes kind of voice and so that's that's kind of interesting so. oh yeah i mean there's um um when it comes to especially like characters like that there's um what was i just thinking of the other day there's um that's a little bit what we're trying to uh, kind of do with our newest music with a carl and exo Janney project we're trying to um like the most one of the newest songs that we released was a little bit like stemmed from uh, um, it was probably one of the most honest songs that we had ever put out the song called way to you um, we did I, again going back to the Johnny Cash thing I, I, I'm happy that you brought it up because it's one of those inspirations that the way that they captured his voice and the way that he delivered um, such a such a sad message really so masterfully like that inspired us we attempted to um well we obviously combined it with the electronic music but we did similar tech we tried to take sad points in time capture that the best that we can in those lyrics and a vocal delivery and we kind of combined it with the trance you know big room sound that allowed it to kind of it's okay to have those reverberating vocals in that kind of environment and it'll still be received well yeah um and uh yeah it, that's the uh, that was one of the most uh i mean that was we technically made it in 2021 but it came out early part of this year and we're kind of going more and more down in that down that path because it's uh um if you one thing that has really changed um Sorry if I'm segueing a little bit, but no, one thing that's really changed in the in the industry is that um, definitely before the pandemic, there was um, much more mentality that if you uh, produce things in a certain way, it's going to get played. It's going to, you know, people, uh, music was getting kind of formulaic at that point. Little. And the pandemic really kind of broke a lot of these patterns of thinking, I think, because um, people just weren't experiencing the same stuff anymore. Yeah. And... I think people were going through also harder times. People were completely rethinking their lives, and it allowed for, I suppose, more realness to be. I mean, it's the of, only uh, inserted time I think in recent history where like everybody all over the world got traumatized in the same way, at the same time. I mean, it sounds kind of bad, but you know, yeah. it's, it's a shared hardship, I guess. <laughs> it's like one way to look at it. Right, and uh, I'm. I'm not happy that people went through that, but in terms from the creative standpoint, yeah. it changed something in the industry where people are open to more. I mean, to realness Tupac, again. you get a rose from the concrete, you know. So I don't know. Exactly, and uh, I mean, musically speaking, that's kind of where we're trying to dive deeper and deeper into interesting subjects, try to capture that in a cool way with our vocals. We're probably going to expand a little bit in how we can do that with the production, and um, but where it's you know it's always going to be within the electronic dance world i think the what's what's always nice about trance there's something about um it being a journey that people are okay with that longer form journey it's not just about here's a drop and here's a instant satisfaction always um that allows for i think it allows for a bit more flexibility in terms of expression it's it's um we're, we're, we're sort of, uh, from a creative point of view, that's what I've been dabbling with the most recently. That's awesome. So, I'm going to re-listen to Way to You probably on the way home from the studio and just think about it from that perspective. Because the last time I heard it, I guess I was kind of just taking it more at face value. I didn't, I didn't look as, as into it. So, yeah. and, and that's, see, that's the, that's the thing. It's, um, I'm glad that you could perceive it in all those different ways. If you're in a good mood, hopefully you can also still feel that way. But, yeah. If you're not having a great day and you really listen to the lyrics, like, you know, we had some friends who died and, you know, it inspired some of those lyrics. And it's, that. um, then you can see it from a completely different point of view, depending on where you're coming from. Yeah. Well, I, I feel like if I'm having a horrible day or, or something's gone wrong or I, I lose someone, like, so I like just listening to something where, you know, you're like somebody else has had a similar experience and, and maybe I'm not so alone in the world. I mean, like, you know, I, I think that applies to comedy. I think the blues, you know, in particular, that comes out a lot. Um, and then, I mean, you know, like in a track like Way to You, I mean, that's 
that's not necessarily a bad thing, right? I don't think that's going to bring someone down as much as make them feel like they're not the only one and, and maybe be unifying. Uh, right. Exactly. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's, um, yeah, that's the great thing about music too. Always coming back to that community, people, it's a way for people to feel things together. And, uh, that's never gonna, you know, never gonna change for me. I think that's, I'll always be coming back to try to chase those kinds of experiences. Yeah, that's that's a beautiful thing. Yeah, I feel like I uh, I got to get to more concerts. Although I've got like four coming up this next month. I'm seeing Chris Rock. I'm seeing that bluegrass band I mentioned. I'm seeing like two other comedians, Doug Stanhope, and then also um, Sam Morell, who's a New York-based comic um, from Manhattan, actually, who. Uh, He's pretty funny. He's got, I'll, I can send you some of his stuff afterward if you want, but he's, uh, him, this comedian Mark Norman, and this other guy Joe List have kind of been coming up together if you've been following them at all. And Mark Norman got some play recently because Jerry Seinfeld called him out as being like one of the greatest up-and-coming comics. And then Amy Schumer produced one of his shows, which got him, you know, a little bit more, you know, in the limelight. It's similar to what you were describing with, you know, like a, a big name, you know, DJ producer sort of putting you on a spotlight. And um, I don't know, there's there's some really good stuff coming out. I feel like in so many different uh, areas of just art and creative expression, it's, it's just so beautiful to see. And, you know, I mean, I, I feel like people will pine for, you know, the old days a lot of times, you know, for certain things. And it's like, well, we got good stuff now, too. I mean, that was also good. And, and it all is a progression, and it's great, but, you know, there's, there's good stuff still coming out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And uh, hopefully uh, more and more uh, variety of cool stuff is possible. It's, it's, I think that's where everything's going. It's uh, hopefully, um, I mean, again, coming back to uh, um, hopefully can people continue to try to uh, remember the importance of, of course, making a great message, trying to convey that the best they can, um, but allowing for a greater variety of messages to be put out there and to be understood, that would be very cool. Um, I think we're definitely going through towards just that variety part. Our platforms are allowing it. Um, people are kind of craving something new, uh, you know, especially with the access that we have to everything. It's uh, There's more availability to have something new. Um, I mean, that sounds kind of uh, vague, but I think, uh, you know, variety is the future, I suppose. Yeah. Well, I think it's been going that way for, for decades and, and probably longer that we just don't know because there wasn't recordings back then. But, I mean, I don't know. Like, if you look at music from, like, the 1930s, at least what survived, I mean, there's variety. But I feel like if you look at music now, there's way more variety. and in between every decade, I feel like you just get, you know, exponentially more and more different offshoots and, you know, just different subgenres and uh, new technologies. I mean, I guess in the EDM world, are there any technologies that have come out in the last 10 years? Um, like you mentioned Ableton and Pro Tools, uh, but I mean, that was logic, but those have been around for, you know, probably since the 90s, as far as I know. Um, is there is there anything that's that's kind of come out recently that's sort of changed the game up a little bit uh, for you? Um, what changed the game was discovering platforms like Splice. Um, I actually have a, a, a good friend who uh, works there here in New York City. Brought me to um, their um, kind of their headquarters to their studios when they were starting to you know expand, um, and just to kind of give a quick. Um, kind of rundown of what that's about and what other platforms like that are doing is uh, there is basically like a rent to own platform for plugins that's made it more accessible. It kind of started, Oh, cool. I, I, maybe not, maybe not them, but you know, they were one of the major uh, companies that I was aware of that was making, you know, plugin that would be a hundred bucks easier to access. You can pay for it in you know, installments, you know, 10 bucks a month instead and still be able to get the same quality tools. So I think ever since then, all these other companies have kind of gone towards that model. Since then, that's been a big change. And the other thing, the major thing that really drew me to the, that type of platform was the, um, just like you have Spotify, people like uploading new music from 
you know, all kinds of sources, they've been expanding the types of people that are able to upload new samples for producers to use on demand. You can basically you use this, you know, pay for a certain amount of credits per month and you're able to use those credits to download whatever sound you want. So now you don't even have to spend the time. Um, if you need something right on demand, you can just pull it right out of the cloud, basically. That's pretty and cool. it's made high quality production like 10 times easier than when I was 10 years ago trying to figure out how to make a kick drum or a bass sound or something from scratch with like barely any tutorials. Now there's tutorials on YouTube. You can pull the sounds out of splice, not only the sounds, but like templates for your, um, maybe the best way to explain this is like a, you have a synthesizer or something and you can pull out, pull a patch, a specific patch out of the cloud for you to use on your computer to create a certain sound or a template to make another sound. Um, that's been the major game changer and it's not brand new, but, um, in case anybody doesn't know about it, they should check that stuff out. Cause it's made, um, the way to get the results a lot faster and more and cheaper. So, yeah, that's awesome. I mean, that, so splice gives you access to, um, different patches. You can get different sounds with, and then different, um, it almost sounds like plugins as well that you can run stuff through where it's amortized. So you don't have to pay for it all on the front end and go for broke just to try it out. Exactly. And there's that trial period. You don't have to buy it, buy it if you don't want it. You know, it's a, that's a fantastic model. And, um, Smart. especially knowing that, uh, you know, someone who's just starting on music doesn't, not sure if they want to invest into a pro studio, they're able to get that uh, quality as soon as possible, just out of working at home with what they got. Um, I don't think that there's a, it, it removes the need for expertise, but it helps definitely get you there sooner. Um, and I think just like making it easy for a good guitar teacher gets you into the game to learn the first few chords, to be able to play something that you really enjoy. Hopefully that uh, this all allows for that in electronic music. Yeah, that's awesome. That sounds like it's probably making it way more accessible. And just from a business perspective, I would imagine they're selling way more, uh, I want to say units of product, but licenses uh, just by giving people a taste before they have to commit to it. I mean, I, I, I would think that would just be a better business model in general. Absolutely. I, I totally agree. That's, uh, um, and, uh, again, the ability, to, I believe there's also a ability to share projects too. That, that is like, oh, you know, cool. you're able to download whole, whole sessions that somebody, somebody made. I'm not sure if that's a splice or some other platform. I have to go check that out. I don't do that as often, but you know, the, um, that exists as well. So you, you basically have a template for how to, how someone made a certain song and you can go and make it your own now. Yeah. I mean, that's what I liked about Fruity Loops when I was, you know, messing around in high school was the fact that you could just go in and start with somebody else's song that already sounds awesome and then play with that and get your confidence up, you know, <laughs> for like someone like me that was just an amateur. I mean, that it made it more accessible. So. Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, what kind of music were you making when you were in uh, Fruity Loops at the time? Uh, so, I mean, it's like nothing special. I was just kind of like general electronic. I mean, I, I was really only getting started and then ended up kind of getting shipped to boarding school before I could get super into it. Where I didn't have a computer for a while. So, unfortunately, it, it broke me out maybe like two years in. And so I couldn't, I, I never really went all the way down that path. But, yeah, you know, I, I was having some fun with it. I, I was just starting to kind of mess around with like basic beats and stuff. If that makes sense. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. I know that um, what really made it huge was um, what was that? I remember a tutorial like Soldier Soldier Boy. Um, <laughs> he has that song cranked at, and like he was, I think he made the beats in Fruity Loops. That's and awesome. I know that like like Martin Garrix was uh, he made the song Animals. I think that was made in Fruity Loops as well. Yeah, when they always like, ship a bunch uh, of that stuff with the software. At least back in like 2003 when I was using that, they would. And so it was neat. Yeah. You could sort of get under the hood and like mess with the sequencing and stuff. And yeah, it was, it was yeah. fun. I didn't yeah, realize Soldier absolutely. Boy was doing that now. That's, that's great. Yeah, that was like, that was way back when I saw that. I thought it was, um, it was great. It's just crazy how simple it was. And, you know, I think he, um, a similar, he used, he used like some sort of preset that just 
sounded good and he made the comp the composition brought it to life um i think a awesome. similar thing is actually the story of like darude sandstorm i think that yeah i would imagine sample... that was probably pretty pretty basic to make just at least i mean obviously i didn't do it but you know, it's like yeah i think they, i think you just went through a ton of samples and they found that and it was them the whole you know concept of the song like you know that's, this is crazy to think that you know that was even back then it was possible so yeah that sure. is uh it's cool <laughs> yeah no I, I agree awesome well i feel like we're probably at like a good stopping point is there anything you want to plug or mention you know before we sign off no i mean i guess all i would really say is that you know thank you for having me of course and uh, you know if anyone's interested um i know that uh, we didn't get too much into it but um i'm currently working with a recruitment a specialized recruitment agency named lawrence harvey um if you're on the tech side interested in having a chat about anything that we're doing feel free to contact me if you're on the music side of course feel free to um contact me through polarbullproductions.com and I'm, I'm sure i'll send you the links as well so you could uh add them wherever you yeah, like and I, I will say on the lawrence harvey side the more i looked into you know some of your coworkers there uh the more i realized like you guys are super connected i mean just i think like your one director i had like a hundred contacts in common with him on linkedin just like just pretty much everyone in the industry and then like another buddy of mine who's a director at a big robotics company reached out with one of your job descriptions to me and was like hey spence check out this lawrence harvey job description <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> so I, I was impressed, and so like that's that's awesome. Um, PolarBullProductions dot com. We'll put it in the description too. Uh, thanks for coming on. This has been such a pleasure. Absolutely, Spencer. Anytime. Thank you so much. Awesome.